attended to, I want to acknowledge the OCLC Research Library Partnership, which both underwrites and inspires uh, our work here. Um, attendees of this webinar are from the OCLC RLP, and I really want to thank you for your continued support and input into our work. These are both critical to our success. Um, so with that, I am thrilled to welcome our presenters. I'll go ahead and turn things over to Andrew so we can get his slides all set up. Um, our presenters today are Andrew Lee, author of The Wikipedia Revolution and also a really active member in the Wikimedia DC chapter, and Robert Fernandez uh, from Prince George's Community College and also with the Wikimedia DC chapter. And uh, just on a personal note, Andrew and Rob have both been just super helpful to me in my journey as a Wikipedian and a Wikimedian, and it's been really great to work with them um, and talk to them about opportunities that libraries have for um, contributing to and participating in Wikidata and other Wikimedia projects. So, Andrew, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you, and you can take it away here. Great. Uh, Mary Lee, you can hear me okay? Yes, you sound fantastic. For, uh, I should mention uh, Andrew is joining us from Brazil okay. where he's helping to do a workshop on Wikidata. So thank you for joining us from, uh, from afar, Andrew. <laughs> yeah, th thanks a lot. This is, uh, I'm in beautiful Brazil where it's 85 degree winter. So we are actually doing a Wikidata workshop here in University of Sao Paulo. We're doing this Wikidata workshop, and then we have another Wikidata workshop in D.C. For a Wikidata trainings in one week for our Wikimedia D.C. contingent. So uh, thanks a lot for joining us. And if you are uh, just joining us, if you want to load up the slides there, um, you can see them on the screen. There also is a survey. If you could take that very quick survey, it should take only about 15, 20 seconds, just to kind of get your temperature of how much you know about Wikipedia, Wikidata, and just databases in general. So that is bit.ly slash OCLC18 Wikidata survey. So that's all lowercase, bit.ly slash OCLC18 Wikidata survey. And we really appreciate uh, you filling that out. And it gives us a better sense of um, the audience that we're talking to. If you want to follow along with the slides, you're going to see them on the screen, but if you also want to access them later on or live, it's also at bit.ly OCLC18 Wikidata, OCLC18 Wikidata. And then uh, later on, we'll be talking about a one-page guide to um, Wikidata that I think is a nice roadmap for a lot of folks who are coming to you. Okay, so let's get started. So my name is Andrew Lee. I am the author of the Wikipedia Revolution. So if you really want to know about the history of Wikipedia, um, this is now a 10-year-old history, but most of everything that we talk about in that book is very much relevant today to how um, the subtitle says, how a bunch of nobodies created the world's greatest encyclopedia. Um, I'm a digital sharing strategist. I'm full-time now with digital strategy, and I've been a journalism professor in the past. And I'll let Rob introduce himself real quickly and what he does with the Wikimedia DC chapter. Hello, I'm Robert Fernandez. I'm a, Rob, I am personally not in Brazil. Oh, unfortunately, I'm not in Brazil. <laughs> I'm back here in Maryland at Prince George Community College, where I'm a librarian. And I'm on the board of Wikimedia DC. And, you know, Andrew talked about our work. We do a lot of outreach. We do a lot of events, training, that sort of thing. So if you're interested and in the area, please let us know and we'll help you out. Great, thanks, Rob. Um, as we said, you know, we do a lot of things in DC. With the sure, the Wikimedia movement. So that means that we are a um, group of volunteers, but also we have one full-time staffer that organizes a lot of activities that we do with libraries, archives, museums. We work with the kind of the big three in DC: Library of Congress. National Archives, where there actually is a full-time Wikimedia in residence. There is uh, someone who is a federal employee who is paid to uh, interface National Archives with Wikipedia. And also Smithsonian, we do a lot of work there with um, the archives and with the different museums that are there, especially with linked open data. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. 
So we like to describe Wikidata as the evolution of not just Wikipedia, but primarily Wikipedia into the ultimate free linked open database. So there's a lot of buzzwords here with linked open, uh, you know, uh, semantic web that we're going to try to decipher for you today. Um, we like to describe, you know, the structuring of Wikidata, I'm sorry, Wikipedia content into things that are machine readable as one of the main motivations of what we do. One of the guides that you might find useful during the talk, and especially after the talk, is this Wikidata in one page guide. And we really found this has been useful because there's so much to understand in the Wikidata universe. This is all of that in just kind of one snapshot with, with the best tools at your disposal for starting to interact with Wikidata. And we'll be talking about many of these things today in the talk. So that is Wikidata dash one page. And that is actually, um, translated into multiple languages. So yeah, Marilee, if I'm cutting out on certain things, feel free to uh, elaborate or to ask me to repeat something that is uh, important. Okay, yeah, so you're, you're 2017, data, 2017 was it? I was just gonna say your audio is just cutting out periodically. Um, I, I think it's probably a bandwidth issue on your end, uh, but overall you're, you're fairly audible. Okay, but feel free to just jump in on something that wasn't clear and I'll be happy to repeat. Um, yeah. Rob can type into the box uh, with any kind of elaboration since we've done this several times before. So 2017 was a real turning point for Wikidata. Um, what you may or may not know they might look very similar to what comes back in the Google Knowledge Graph when you do a Google search. Um, a lot of digital systems heavily use Wikidata for returning answers to questions that you might ask Alexa, Siri, or Google. Wikipedia are actually being mapped over and being stored in a central database, which is what Wikidata does. Hey, Citations Andrew. and references in a conference called Wikisite. Yeah, yeah, Andrew, you're you're getting um your your audio quality is really degrading. Um I wonder if it's possible for you to uh to possibly switch over to the phone. Oh yeah, we can do that. Yeah, and I can I can take over uh, while you're doing see. that. So um okay, maybe sure. why yeah, why don't you, go ahead, Rob. Yeah, why don't we just go to the next slide and I'll continue on with what I was gonna say. Because um, right here, we, we talk about the, we wanna talk about the why up front. Because we talk in um, webinars and trainings like this, we, there's a lot of how. How do we do this, how do we do that? But the number one question I hear from librarians is why? Like, why should we do this? How does this fit into our mission? And so I do like to stress that we have a shared mission. Librarians have always been about the stewardship, the preservation, the dissemination, the access to knowledge, and the Wikipedia projects at their core are all about that. And so we have the same mission, and so we should be participating in that. And who better to participate than, who is more equipped to participate in that kind of mission than we are, librarians. And in practical terms, your patrons are already there. This is the world's largest information resource. Your patrons are using it, so you need to know how your patrons are accessing knowledge. So you can help them and steer them towards other resources that they might not know about, that they won't find it in Google search. And we know about book publishing, we know about scholarly publishing, and so we should know about how, we know how knowledge is created in those worlds, so we should know how knowledge is created in this world, in the Wikipedia, in the Wikimedia world. And we are, we participate in consortiums, consortiums of other libraries and OCLC, where our items are in WorldCat, our digital collections are in Dipla. And so this should be part of that world. If we could switch to the next slide. Yeah, this is just one example, and you'll see the slide again, one example of how Wikidata in particular is part of this, part of the um, knowledge ecosystem. It's in VIAF, it, you know, it goes back and forth. Um, so yeah, go ahead and switch to eight. Um, 
And in more practical terms, why should we do stuff like this? I want to show you an example of a project that uses Wikidata in a library setting. Um, Dan, okay, here we are. Dan Scott at Laurentian University um, put a bit of code in his library catalog that when you, when a patron searches for a, a musical item, it pulls information about the performer from Wikidata. It pulls a picture, it provides links to the website, provides links to more information, and so that's a very practical thing that can, can get results. And then too often in our world, we exist in silos and we do small scale projects on our own. And by putting those projects, linking those projects to Wikidata, we can leverage that collected resource and we get more than we put it. We can, with a little bit of effort, we can draw on all that knowledge and pull it right back. Like you could not the resources that it would take to maintain a small database of information about performers for your own catalog would be incredibly time consuming, but all you have to do is put in that Wikidata queue number and you get all the information that you need. And so this is a really, can be a really powerful tool. So let's check in with Andrew and see if he is back yet. Yeah, can you hear me okay now on phone? Yeah, you're a little, um, the, the volume's not as good, but you're not cutting out. So okay. I think that's okay. a win. So I'm going to try to, I'll try to speak up and hopefully everything will be okay and just let me know if anything is unusable here. Okay. So we're going to go over some basic things on why Wikidata and why was it designed the way it was. Um, we're going to show you some examples of queries and tools and some case studies on how Wikidata has been used in interesting ways. And then Marilee's going to have some interesting things for you folks to do in the library world on some calls to action uh, on what kind of activities you can already start doing on Wikidata. So does that sound okay, everyone? I hope that sounds fine. Okay, so right now Wikipedia English at least has more than 5 million articles going on 6 million. Um, it is one of the top 10 most visited websites in the entire world and certainly the reputation of Wikipedia has increased quite a bit since its early days in the, um, since 2001 when it launched. So we are seeing more and more folks working with Wikipedia in ways that are really exciting and interesting. But one of the problems with Wikipedia is that the knowledge, even though we have so many articles, is still scattered among 30 million different articles across 200 some languages. So although it's better than any encyclopedia we've had so far in human history, there are still lots of inconsistencies, gaps, and replication of information across Wikipedia. So the question is, how do we consolidate all these knowable facts into a location that helps us share the strengths across these different language communities? And that's where the impetus for Wikidata came from. So this is very similar to what happened starting in 2001 when images were actually uploaded to specific language editions of Wikipedia. So English, German, French, Spanish, all had images that were local to their editions and they weren't sharing multimedia. And in 2004, Wikimedia Commons, which many of you know, was created as a centralized and consolidated multimedia portal for images and multimedia. And we've had that for, you know, 14 plus years at this point. So similarly, we wanted to try to create a resource that converted the lexical content in Wikipedia articles into structured statements that could be shared across different editions of Wikipedia, but also to the world, right, through a linked open database. So we want to turn the hum human readable into machine understandable, and in the process also link to the stable external data of land institutions, so authority control records, identifiers, and this is really realizing what we um, have been promised since the 1990s of the semantic web that really is kind of the, the most popular way that the semantic web has been realized. So here's an example of that in practice. You know, this is all good in the abstract, but let's talk about some concrete examples. So if you look at the United States Congress article in Wikipedia, you'll notice that there are facts that are asserted in this article. Uh, the United States Congress is a bicameral legislature of the federal government. It meets in the Capitol. Here are its coordinates on the map. You also find out in the info box on the right-hand side some interesting information about it. If you scroll down in that article in Wikipedia, you'll see that there's also some other metadata about Congress 
um, about its members and leaders, about what caucuses there are, about the committees that are there. So this is all information that is very nice to read. They've been created by volunteers in what we call navigation boxes and info boxes, but they're all, you know, not really in a structured database. They're just nice to read on the page. So how do we turn what is here into something that is more universally shared and structured? So Wikidata was launched in 2012 with this in mind of how do you bring the power of searching, sorting, and querying to all this information that is scattered across articles? And that's why maybe Wikidata is best described as the interconnected mesh of all human knowledge, not just the sum, not the passive sum, but the mesh of all human knowledge that you can actually work with in a way that's more robust. So the fundamental kind of building block of Wikidata is the fact that claims or statements um, are three-part things in Wikidata. So if you know something about the uh, semantic web uh, discussions that have been happening, this is sometimes expressed as a subject, predicate, and object, or an item has a property that's related to another value, or just very simply, something has a relationship to something else in this database. So this is something that we are uh, trying to model using these three-part statements in Wikidata. So for example, here with the Wikidata item for the United States Congress has at the very top a label that says United States Congress, and then it also has aliases, where you see it says also known as US Congress, American Congress, legislator of the United States. So this is quite nice. This is actually the step one of being the semantic web, that the underlying item can have multiple things that refer to it as with different labels and different languages and different types of uh, descriptions that we have there. So if you scroll down longer into the Wikidata item for United States Congress, you will see that there are other statements that say instance of a bicameral legislature. The United States Congress is part of the federal government of the United States. It is in the country of the United States of America. So this is all that a Wikidata item really is, is just multiple statements like this trying to describe the United States Congress. So this is what we often call a triple or a three-part statement. Um, and we have two types of items in Wikidata. The first one is what we call Q items. And Q items are just what we saw before. The United States Congress had a Q and a number afterward. And anyone can make a Q item. And they roughly translate or roughly map to a Wikipedia article. But the standard for notability in Wikidata is actually lower. So you can actually have Wikidata items that would never have a Wikipedia article but are useful for modeling the world. So here are some examples of Q numbers in the Wikidata universe. Um, obviously, Q1 being the universe makes a lot of sense. Q2 is Earth. Q5 is human. Q146 is cat. Don't ask me why cat was modeled before animal, probably because Wikipedians really like cats. Um, Q571 is book. Q7075 is library. OCLC is Q190593. And, um, Librarian's joke, Cardigan is 877140. So these are numbers that really don't mean anything in, to us as humans, but they are unique identifiers for these concepts. The other type of item that we have in Wikipedia, I'm sorry, Wikidata, is the P number. And these are properties. And unlike Q items, these are very tightly controlled. These are a controlled vocabulary for consistency. So these are things that relate things to each other. So you have things like instance of P31 or subclass of something else, P279, or you have identifiers that are also properties. So the VFID is P214, or you might store the date of birth of someone, that's P569. So these are only about 4,000 to 5,000 in number on Wikidata right now. So P numbers are proposed, they're debated, they are contemplated and then they are finally voted upon, accepted or not accepted. So we want these P numbers to be very well thought out as they are, you know, part of what is kind of um, inherently the schema of the database of Wikidata. So just remember Q numbers anyone can create. Hopefully you don't want to replicate anything. And then P numbers are tightly controlled in Wikidata. So if we want to look at the the snapshot of a full Wikidata item, this is pretty much what you will see when you bring up a Wikidata item, for example, Q23 being George Washington, 
you will see the label and then multiple statements or claims below that. Then the underlying part of Wikidata is just these triples with two numbers and P numbers, and we provide meaning by providing the English language labels or the Portuguese labels or the Spanish labels on top of it, right? So Q23, P31, Q5 just says George Washington is an instance of a human being. Very obvious to us, but it's useful for looking at it. We want to know whether he's fictional or non-fictional. So the great thing is that we can give the same three-part statement to someone speaking Spanish or French, and they can make sense of it because they have the different labels in their language on top. So yeah, this is just basically what the other... If I could just have a on. second, I think it's really important to stress that in most cases, the value is not a text field, it's not a wide open field, it's another item. It's another item with another Q number. So in a way, that controls the vocabulary and also interlinks all these statements. That's a great point, Rob. When you enter that third value in Wikidata, you're very much constrained. It has to match a Q number that is already in Wikidata, which solves a lot of the problems we have in Wikipedia, anything of people making typos or adding erroneous information. Um, that uh, things that don't exist, you have to model it first before you can enter it into Wikidata. Unless, as Rob says, the last item there, which is like the LC, Library of Congress Auth ID, that might be a free text string that refers to an identifier at Library of Congress. But even here, you can provide a regular expression or some kind of filter that says, you know, it must be a letter followed by numbers. So you can have bounds checking and constraints for even entering free text, which is one of the nice things about uh, Wikidata. Um, so what you might not have known is that the link to the Wikidata item has been hiding in plain sight all the time on a Wikipedia page. So in the lower left-hand corner of any Wikipedia page, depending on your scrolling or whether you're on a desktop device, you will see a link to the Wikidata item and you can actually inspect it. And I encourage you to try this. It's actually really kind of neat to see what the structured statements around a topic look like when compared to the Wikipedia page. So right there is Wikidata item. You can click on that and visit the Wikidata item corresponding to that Wikipedia page. And this is an example of what it would look like for United States Congress. And you can see here's the item, there is the property, and there is the value, which is the controlled Q number that must exist in Wikidata before it can be entered. Okay, so this is kind of like editing on Rails uh, where it, it, there's you know, more guidance when you're entering stuff here than you would when you're editing a Wikipedia article, which is free text or wiki text. Yeah, and Karen made a really good point in chat that by using this kind of method, by making your value a Q number, it makes it truly language neutral because you're working with Q numbers. And so you'll be seeing your interface in your language and someone else will be seeing their interface in their language, but it will be linking to the same Q number regardless of language. The Q numbers are language neutral. Right. And then John asked a question, are the labels preferred or alternate for Q nodes auto-copied or synced with Wikipedia technical articles, or are they maintained completely separately? That's a great question. They're, they're linked, not formally, but they are very, very similar. So the nice thing about Wikidata is you can have John Smith, John Smith, John Smith, John Smith, um, but then there's a description field that says John Smith born 1875 or John Smith born in 1922. So right. you can have and a it label will not let you colliding with each other. Oh. Yeah, I was going to say it's kind of right. not going to let you create an item that has the same exact two items that have the same label and the same description. So the descriptions have to be different, even if the label is John Smith. Right. And then if you know something about Wikipedia, you know that Wikipedia does have this problem of having a John Smith poet. John Smith writer in parentheses, or John Smith writer 17th century, or John Smith writer 18th century. So we have a lot of problems in Wiki, that Wikipedia with having to come up with an article title that tries to make the person uniquely identifiable simply in the title. Wikidata, Wikidata does not suffer from that problem because it's the semantic web, right? So the Q number is unique underneath, and it can be John Smith and 20 John Smith, but the items and the um, the statements within that Wikidata item help distinguish one John Smith from another John Smith. So that, that's a great question. And that's the benefit of Wikidata is that the statements underneath help to um, provide this clarification between colliding names. Um, right, and then the, 
this, the comment from Karen here says, descriptions are language specific. Each can have a long list of also known as correct. And that's very useful. And I'll show you a really uh, interesting example later on of one of the more famous folks in, our, in history that has more than 50 also known as. Uh, so let's get back to Wikidata statement triples. So these claims are basically three parts. And they have the Q number, the P number, and then another value, which can be a Q number or something else. The nice thing about this is that once you have these relationships modeled in Wikidata, you can do all kinds of neat things, like say, well, a bicameral legislature is a subclass of a legislature. It's a subclass of multicameralism. Um, and you can do all kinds of interesting searches and matches based on um, this kind of hierarchy in this ontological model that you have. So the nice thing about Wikidata as a database is that relationships are what we call first class um, objects, whereas in other kind of databases, relationships have to be inferred. Here, you can see that the instance of or the um, date of birth, these relationships are right up front and center in a um, in the Wikidata or any kind of RDF database that's out there. It's also very highly adapted and very quick to search. So for example, um, we'll show you some examples later on where searching the entire database is very fast. So for anyone who has worked with a traditional database, you know that um, things like SQL or relational databases have been really useful to us, but they are somewhat rigid, right? That you need a schema that's well-defined and controlled. You need to design these, you need to stay consistent, you need to have buy-in from anyone using the database on how you model what's going on in the database, right? So changes to the schema or the design of a database can be very expensive or complex because you affect lots of folks down the line when you make a change to the structure of these tables and databases. Um, and then also searches involving relationships, which are links across these tables, can be very slow and very expensive. So anyone who's worked with databases knows that join operations can often be very painful in creating very, very long queries. So the benefit of Wikidata and RDF databases is that these relationships are, in fact, explicit in a database, and a database can kind of take any shape and grow according to need. Sometimes these are known as graph databases for exactly this reason. So, for example, here, if you're looking at the painter Edward Hopper, you can see that he was a citizen of the United States, um, but that he is the creator of Nighthawks or Cape Cod Morning, and Nighthawks is an instance of painting, uh, which is a subclass of creative work. So you can see just from this graph that is here, searching for things like show me all creative works that were done by citizens in the United States is simply following this graph um, in a way that is very fast in an RDF database. So this is the, the difference between these kind of new graph databases versus old traditional relational databases. So this is an important thing to just kind of understand about how databases are, uh, are designed in the RDF model. So what are some of the upsides and downsides of this issue of using RDF databases? Well, one of the cool things about RDF triples and having a database that is just, you know, three-part statements is it's very flexible and very fast. It's very suitable for the wiki culture of just putting in what you know at the time you know it and being bold and trying new things. And what's fascinating about it is that means that you can have multiple parallel ontologies coexisting at the same time which is pretty neat. So that means that an art history person can be working in one corner of Wikidata and a um, photograph collections expert can be working another side of Wikidata and they don't have to necessarily mesh their understanding of what is depicted in a photo or how to catalog photos. Now the downside of this approach is that this schema on the fly, and that's no schema because it's just a bunch of triples, can, be make, can make modeling very inconsistent and difficult. So. Um, this can be very hard for newcomers to understand. If you're adding a painting to Wikidata, you need to kind of dig around and find out how paintings have been modeled by a certain museums or certain experts. So the same upside, which is that multiple parallel ontologies can coexist, is also a big downside, which is that multiple parallel ontologies can coexist and not really be in harmony with each other in Wikidata. It's so this is something that is curious. <laughs> That's correct. <laughs> That's a great way to it. Is the bug is a feature? Yes, it's both. Um, which means that there's really exciting things that people can do to help reconcile these different models and, and the way things are modeled, but it also can create some chaos. And that's, pretty, that's one of the things I'm doing down here in Brazil is working with GLAM institutions to find a model for certain types of paintings. 
So here's an example of the question that I think someone asked before is, um, or mentioned is you can have lots and lots of aliases. Well, how many? Well, here's a great example, Muammar Gaddafi. So anyone who's kind of read about Muammar Gaddafi over the years, you've, you've seen his name change depending on whether you read about him in uh, the Associated Press or Washington Post or, or French media. Sometimes it's Gaddafi with a G, a K, a Q. And the great thing about Wikidata is, well, the person is still the person. That's Q19878. You can put as many labels or synonyms or aliases as you want on top of it. And um, there are more than 50 Latinized versions of the pronunciation or the pronunciation or spelling of his name. And this is not just useful for Muammar Gaddafi. This is useful for any time you're trying to remove language dependence and ambiguity, whether it's writing systems. So you would have the same Q number whether you write someone's name in Cyrillic or Latin or Chinese or Korean. Um, it also helps with phonetization variations, spelling variations, and especially maiden versus married names, right? So once someone gets married, um, is it uh, Meghan Markle or is it Meghan, Duchess of whatever? You can fight about it all day in Wikipedia. Wikidata doesn't care. Wikidata knows her as Q something, and you can change the labels or add more labels on top of that. Yeah, so Wikidata so is essentially it's a giant name authority file in every language that you could want. Absolutely, and we're seeing a lot of GLAM organizations getting very excited about utilizing Wikidata for no other purpose than just that, <laughs> mapping over spellings and, and things like this. So what other possibilities do we have now? Well, Wikidata has now more than 48 million items. The great thing is simple searches, even across 48 million items, usually take less than a second. Uh, and then complex queries can be supported by open standards like Sparkle. So Sparkle is at the tip of a lot of people's tongues now, it is the emerging language that most people are learning to search these types of databases. So here's just a very simple example of how you can use a language like Sparkle to find out results. So for example, we're looking before at three part statements, you know, George Washington was an instance of a human, but let's say we want to find all bicameral legislatures and Sparkle is very, fairly straightforward in this case where we can basically say, question mark legislature, like what legislature is P31 an instance of, and then Q189445, which is a bicameral legislature. So it's basically just creating a pattern, like what is an instance of a bicameral legislature? And then if you run this query in the query.wikimedia.org, I'm sorry, query.wikidata.org, you will find that it brings back a list. And this example showed that it, re it searched 20 some million items. This is a older example here, but it searched 20 some million items in one third of a second. And that's pretty impressive, even for folks who are used to fast database performance, this is pretty impressive. It can do that simple search in less than a second. Um, so that you can see that it is returning legislatures in India, in the US, Canada, Kenya, and that's the power of the Sparkle uh, query that you can do very quickly like this. Um, one of the most useful things, as Rob said before, is that it's not just um, three-part statements that point to Wikidata, it's three-part statements that point to external databases. And then also external databases are pointing back now to Wikidata. So here's an example, if you look at the via, uh, entry for the Barack Obama uh, bio here, you can see that it points to all these other national libraries, but it also points to Wikidata at the bottom near around six o'clock on this dial here. But yeah, what's also cool is that people, go ahead, Rob. Oh, I was just gonna say it's very exciting because nowhere else can you have all these identifiers in the same place, even on VIAF, because we, uh, Wikidata has so many more available. You can link to IMDB, you can link to Twitter, you can link to all kinds of esoteric databases that are not gonna find their way into VIAF or someplace like that. That's right, so as, as Rob said, you know, we have more than 80 identifiers now for something like Barack Obama, and these are not your typical ones, but here's a good cross-section of what you might see. If you look at someone's bio and say, you know, what identifiers do you link out to? Some of these are familiar, like WorldCat, VF, and Dutch, uh, Dutch National Library, but then some other things like PolitiFact, uh, New York Times Topic ID, uh, UK Guardian, um, social networks and archival context, and new kind of projects from National Archives and other folks. So, you know, Wikidata is kind of on the cutting edge of pointing to traditional catalogs, but also to Twitter, to Facebook, to Quora.com, to places you may not think of as the normal places to find linkages. 
So here's some properties that are the most related to OCLC. So you can see there's the FAST ID, which is P2163, VIAF, and then also the OCLC control number. So these are ones that you might want to take a look at to see if there's interesting things happening here and how often they're used across um, Wikidata. One of the really powerful parts of Wikidata over Wikipedia is the whole idea that once you have a model and you can actually define you know, certain fields as having to be a human or having to be um, an organization or the number you enter here has to have a certain format, we have what we call constraint reports and constraint violations. So you can actually provide bumper guards for folks when they enter in information. Um, sometimes these are hard constraints, sometimes these are soft constraints. So for example here, is an example where it says, okay, you've entered in this number, we're going to let you enter in the number, but just to let you know it doesn't really match here because the person who has, um, you've entered an ISBN number, but the entity that you're entering in for isn't a publisher of something, so you should probably fix the model. So these are great ways of providing tasks to folks in Wikidata to say, hey, what you're doing is probably okay, but you should probably fix the model so it will benefit other folks in Wikidata. Um, so, so I think someone had asked the question before, like how do different languages relate to Wikidata? So one of the first big tasks of Wikidata was simply to be a catalog of what Wikipedia articles are related to this topic. So um, the very early days of Wikidata, the main task was to simply just hold the linkages to all the other languages. So here you can see the OCLC article in English language Wikipedia is just OCLC, but in other languages like German, it's Online Computer Library Center, or in Arabic, it's something in Arabic script, and this is just a master pointer to all the canonical articles about OCLC in other languages. So this is kind of the first real use of Wikidata. And then it quickly became very useful for Wikidata to point to identifiers. And that's where you will see, you know, its real value in being a place that is a hub for folks to discover other things like authority control records, accession numbers, catalog identifiers, or stable URLs to other sites um, like Twitter or Facebook to official Facebook pages of organizations, like this, for example. Um, so we like to look at some interesting ways to contribute to Wikidata that have really become popular and allowed Wikidata to go beyond just one person editing one item at one time. So these are what we call alternative contribution methods, and these are actually enumerated on that Wikidata in one page document that you can play with. So one which I think is really exciting is this idea of the Wikidata game, a way to contribute to the wiki knowledge sphere by just clicking with your finger or thumbing with your finger. This is something that's not possible with, Wikidata, with Wikipedia, where we wanted people to write stuff. But Wikidata allows us to click and contribute. And how might this be done? Well, for example, one of the databases that um, you can find on uh, Wikidata is, for example, the Smithsonian American Art Museum. But you can find many library databases, archives here. And what this um, tool called the Wikidata game does is it loads up the entire linked open database of Smithsonian or any external entity. And then it tries to match it against what it thinks are matches in the Wikidata. And all you need to do as a contributor is just to say confirm or remove, yes or no. Basically saying this is a match, this is not a match. So this is pretty exciting in that you can have folks who are not that well versed in wiki editing or in any technical tools. And all they need to do is load up the game and tap yes or no as to a match. And we'd like to see whether the metadata matches uh, among these folks, but we'll show you an example. So here you'll see that the first item here says Christian Bouchard. Oh, this was found in the Smithsonian database. And then we found Christian Bouchard in the Wikidata database. Are these a match? And you can see that although they're both German, the dates of birth do not match. So you would not confirm this as a match. But the second one, which says Santos Chavez, a Chilean. And the second one says Santos Chavez, Chilean graphic designer and painter, 20th century. Um, this is a match by doing some Investigation, so you can actually click on the green link and look at Ch Santos Chavez. You can click on the blue link and look at Santos Chavez and Wikidata and find out they are matched. And when you click on the confirm button, then what it does is it does an edit in Wikidata on your behalf. So you can see down below it says, created a claim. The Smithsonian Art Museum person, institution, the source ID has been matched and it makes an edit on your behalf. So this is really exciting and allows for lots of folks to help match 
Wikidata items against external databases simply by clicking yes, no, or confirm or remove. And I've often played this game on my mobile phone while waiting in line or waiting for the kids to come out of school. And you can actually meaningfully add 50 uh, edits to Wikidata simply by tapping on your phone screen. So that's pretty neat. It does require an account, as Marilee mentioned. So make sure that you have an account before you do that, and you just need to authenticate your account to run the game. But after that, you're off to the races. And this is actually really interesting, and you wind up learning as you do this about folks you never knew about. So it's actually learning by doing at the same time. And you don't need a separate Wikidata account. Your Wikipedia account will work. That's correct. We have a unified login system, so if you have a Wikipedia account already, you're already ready to go. Um, so that's a great point. So some other cool tools when working with Wikidata, these are things that get a lot of researchers and librarians and archivists excited because you can actually run reports on data that you could never do at your own organization, but by combining all the best data for multiple entities, you can run some really neat things. So the most basic thing you can try is the Wikidata query. So this is at query.wikidata.org. And I encourage you to play with this. There is a button that says examples when you load up Wikidata query. And just try running some of the examples. There's some really great simple examples. There's some more complex examples. And they're really easy to access. You can't break anything in the Wikidata by querying it. So don't be afraid to try things. Sparkle is a little bit of an interesting beast. Oh. I was just going to say, don't be intimidated don't. by Sparkle. I can't code. I, I'm not very tech savvy, but I can, the Sparkle query is really easy to use. You could just pull one in existing examples and tweak the parameters. There's an existing example that says like, give me all the cats in Wikidata and you can change that to dogs or donuts or whatever you want. Right, that's a great point. And I always tell folks, no one ever writes a Sparkle query from scratch. You always copy and modify someone else's query. So. I know this is tough for students to get the habit out of students, but I always say copy, 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 you know, never write it from scratch. <laughs> you take someone else's work and build on it. So if you, any of you knows SQL, it is superficially similar to SQL. The concepts are fairly similar, but the syntax might throw you for a little bit of a loop. It is um, not the same as a select statement in SQL, even though it uses the word select. But once you look at some examples, you'll start to get the idea of basically setting down a pattern and these query will return things that match that pattern. So here's an example of a query that Rob just described. Show me all cats in Wikidata. So ignore some of the funny things that say service, wiki base label, all that stuff. That is standard. That's going to be part of every Wikidata query, so you don't even have to know what's going on there. But the main part here is the question mark item WDT colon P31. That basically says, show me the Wikidata instance of, and then WD colon Q146 is a cat. So this is not asking for calico or tabby, which are kinds of cats. These are specific named famous cats that are famous enough to be in Wikidata on their own. These are instances of cats, not subclasses of cats. And believe it or not, there are 116 named famous cats in history that made it into Wikidata. And you can see these like Pixel, Gladstone, Sister Cream, Bob. You might see some familiar names there. So as Rob said, go ahead and play with this. Change it to um, instances of horses, dogs, dolphins, um, goats, all kinds of things you can try here. Don't be afraid to practice and try these things out. The really cool thing about this is once you get results back, depending on what it returns, whether it returns you know, the name of a cat, the geographical coordinates of a city, and the number of visitors to a museum or the scale of something, you can actually show your results in really interesting ways. So the magic of the Wikidata query is it can automatically figure out what column, um, what columns look like and then do the right thing. So you can actually display your results in charts, in a map, in a graph form. Um, so here's a great example of one experiment we did with the Library of Congress. And we had this basic question, where have the members of Congress been educated at? So this is just a very general question, like, you know, what university or institution can claim the most members of Congress being educated there? So this is a very straightforward query where we just basically said, let's list all the members of Congress that have ever served in um, the halls of the Capitol. So the first thing we want to do is say, it should be an instance of a human. Now, again, you're probably thinking, why do you need this very basic thing? Because you actually could have, 
people looking at it, they're fictional Congress people. So we want this to be nonfiction. So we say they're instances of human, P31, Q5. The next thing we want to do is to say they should have a Library of Congress bio ID. So this is where the external database really comes in handy. We say it must be P1157, which is the Library of Congress auth ID. And it, we don't even care what it is. It just needs to exist. And that's what this statement does. It just checks to make sure it exists and it plops it into this variable right there. The next thing we want to do is to make sure that they were educated at somewhere. So we want to grab the school. It's possible that the, library, the member of Congress was never educated, but we want to just grab what we can. And we just grab the educated at statement, which could be multiple. It could be undergrad, grad, law school, higher degrees. And then what we want to do now is to count the occurrences of each school. So we're making a histogram or a statistical uh, distribution. And then we also want to order them from highest to lowest. And believe it or not, that is almost exactly what the Sparkle query looks like. So I stepped it through step by step by step, but that's kind of what the query looks like. I'll show it to you in a second. And we also just want the top 15 results. We don't need 100 or 200 results. All right, so when we do this query, we will see that we get this. So this is probably no surprise to you. You're probably like, oh, Harvard, Yale, Princeton. Yeah, yeah, that's cut. Kind of, whoa, oh, Michigan. Now, when we did this experiment, we were kind of surprised that Michigan was so high up on this list. Sorry, Midwesterners are probably not surprised, but as an East Coaster, I was a little bit surprised here. We went down this list and we said, this is quite interesting. And if you return the geo coordinates of these universities and you can just choose map mode, it'll plot them on a map like that. So you can kind of see geographically that they are very much concentrated towards the East Coast which makes sense because we were 13 colonies in the early years, and then we only spread to the West Coast later on. Um, so we can show the results in tables and map form and chart form, which is really cool. And if you bring up this uh, presentation on your computer, you can even click on the link in the lower top hand corner. All these queries we're showing you, you can just click on the link and try it yourself. But I highly encourage you to do that. You can amaze your friends and colleagues by showing them live queries that you can customize to your heart's delight. Now, what's really interesting here is that when we came up with this list, we thought Michigan is interesting, but what was really interesting was this, Union College. And normally when I talk about this, I ask for a show of hands, how many people here heard of Union College? Not that many. So we're trying to look at this list and say, how does this make sense? I've heard of every other school here, maybe except Union College. And what you wind up doing is looking back in history and you find out that in 1800, the big four Colleges in the U.S. were Harvard, Yale, Princeton, and Union. And that's really kind of a surprise to folks. And Union College lost ground amid a big financial scandal that happened in the mid-1800s, and also uh, a lot of folks going off to fight the Civil War. So they actually had a loss of students and also a financial scandal. But how do we visualize this? And this is where the power of Wikidata comes along. It says, well, let's see the story, not just hear the story. And if you actually go in there and do the same query, so you can see that this is similar to what we saw before, and instead of saying educated at somewhere, we're going to say we want to pinpoint folks who are educated at Union College specifically, right? So that's Q1567748. And we're actually going to also grab the date of birth. So let's try to grab the congressmen that were born, I'm sorry, educated at Union College, and then grab their date of birth. And let's plot this on a timeline. And we can do that because if you return the date of birth in the column, all you need to do is just say plot it on a timeline. So here we are, here are the human labels and the date of birth. And then we choose the timeline option from the menu and we get something like this. So that's really cool. I mean, for anyone who's a data geek, I, I was drawn to this thing, wow, this shows me in one snapshot how significant Union College was before 1850, but look at how non-factor it was after 1850. Similarly, I just, for giggles, I just went back to the query and just changed Union College to Columbia University. And if you change it to Columbia University, you get this graph below. So you will see that, in fact, Union College was much more influential than Columbia pre-1850. But then post-1850, Columbia produced many more members of Congress than that. So that's pretty, pretty amazing to see this on a graph form. And this could really be powerful to show students and folks who are into data. So yeah, so I'll try to move forward faster to show you some of the more interesting examples here, including Reasonator. Um, but just very quickly, to show you the impact of Wikidata, Google had their own kind of linked open data project that they actually killed in 2016 because they saw what Wikidata was doing and said, you folks are doing it faster, better, and on a scale we can't replicate. 
So that shows you how influential Wikidata has been. So Google uses the Wikidata graph database for a lot of what it does with the knowledge graph when it returns content to you in the search form. So let's take a look at some of the last uh, tools here, uh, including uh, graphing Wikidata and also putting Wikidata into readable form. So uh, we're going to skip that. We just talked about that already. Reasonator, here's a really nice tool that's also on the Wikidata in one page. Um, you can see that the Carla Hayden page here um, is actually very human readable, but this is not written by a human. This is actually just taking the Wikidata item and then generating readable prose out of it. Carla Hayden is a U.S. American librarian. She was born on August 10, 1952 in Tallahassee, et cetera, et cetera. So this is all just taking the statements and dumping it out in a readable prose here. So you can kind of see the potential perhaps for auto-generated articles, which is actually what we're working on here as well in Brazil with Portuguese. Um, so this is kind of a neat tool you can play with just to see Wikidata in a more human-friendly way with Reasonator. There's another tool called Squid, which actually goes even further. You can kind of see the structure of how this item is modeled in Wikidata by looking at SQID. This is also in the Wikidata in one page. And then some other cool tools you should know about, Wikidata Timeline, which is really neat that you can actually make queries and it'll show you, for example, you know, the, the reign of different empires or the length of different wars by seeing the start and stop time that it knows from Wikidata. So you can play with that as Wikidata Timeline. And then there are also other games that help match different attributes that we don't have great data for in Wikidata, like ethnicity or colors or what is depicted in painting. And there's more and more gamification of contributing to Wikidata happening every single day. If you're looking for bulk contributions to Wikidata, um, we encourage you to take a look at tools like um, Quick Statements or um, other kinds of API scripting languages that are out there. There's lots of these types of tools that are all described in the Wikidata in one page. And then finally, I thought I'd just show you this Wikidata graph builder, and then we can open up the questions or anything that Merrily wants to introduce in terms of follow-up activities. Wikidata graph builder is a really cool tool that allows you to kind of map out the entire hierarchy of any kind of um, subclass tree on Wikidata. So you can see here, Art Museum is a subclass of Museum of Culture, subclass of Museum, and then it kind of goes all the way up to show you the entire model in Wikidata and how, if you want to add a new type of concept to Wikidata, how it might fit. So I encourage you to play also with Wikidata Graph Builder, and all of these tools have great examples that you can start with, so you don't have to um, play with these things by hand. So Rob, you want to skip to slide 77? Yeah, yeah, let's just, let's give some these folks some, some idea what to do next, where they can take all this information mm -hmm. that we've thrown at them. Okay, um, I don't have slide numbers, so tell me which one it is. Uh, the next step is, there we go, yeah. So mm -hmm. one thing you could do is add your library to Wikidata. I, oh, we've mapped here all the um, libraries in the DC area, and you can see that many are missing because their geographical information, their GPS coordinates are not in Wikidata. I'm sitting in a library right now that's not on this map. So that's something easy you could do. Uh, Dan Scott's written a step-by-step -step guide to adding your library to Wikipedia, to Wikidata, or, and Marilee's um, created a Wikidata treasure hunt that, and a Wikidata exploration tool that uh, you could try right now. And it's very easy and just, you could jump right in. So maybe um, if we have yeah. time, maybe we could take some questions. We could take some questions. And the last thing I wanna mention before we take questions is, um, as Rob said, one of the great things about Wikidata is how incredibly dynamic it is, but it's also kind of hard also to determine whether data sets are complete or well done. So always, before you take what is gospel from a Wikidata query or search, investigate how complete a data set is first, because it might need some tender loving care or some more completeness before you trust the results. And that's it. Okay, great. Um, I am going to uh, advance one slide here. Yeah, so we have um, two kind of hands-on activities that we will leave you guys with. Uh, the Wikidata Treasure Hunt, which was created by my wonderful colleague, Bruce Washburn. Thank you, Bruce, for uh, taking that on. And then Wikidata Explore, which gives you an opportunity to, um, so Treasure Hunt really uh, gives you an opportunity to get your hands um, uh, 
to, to familiarize you with, with Wikidata, to uh, get you familiar with navigating, get you noticing different um, parts of Wikidata, and also seeing how Wikidata uh, connects to other resources such as Wikipedia. Um, so it's really fun. Um, it's, it's four quick questions. Um, I did it last night. I, I had a lot of fun doing it. Wikidata Explorer is uh, more open-ended. Um, what is your institution, your library, uh, people at your institution look like currently in Wikidata? And um, there's some options there to, to do some editing. Um, you, can, you can create an account or you can just hit that edit button and, um, and, and go ahead and edit. Uh, I'm happy to answer any more um, questions about this. Uh, Laura asks a great question, how soon will the recording of the webinar be available? Um, Laura, we usually get them out within a week, sometimes within a couple of days, so uh, very soon. Um, and I'm glad to hear that you're going to share it with your local Wikipedia and, and continue the conversations that you're having there um, at Emory University. Um, let's see, we had a great question, so John, uh, Mark Ockerbloom asked a number of really good questions, probably only have time for one, which is sort of a, a philosophical question. Um, should we consider the ground truth definition for the nodes to be the labels and descriptions within Wikidata? Uh, because the things they link to, such as Wikipedia articles of LC authorities, might be subtly different. Um, so for example, bibliographic identity versus per personal name, or two slightly different concepts modeled in the English versus Spanish Wikipedia. Um, so Andrew or Rob, do you want to take a crack at that, um, kind of the difference between uh, the, the purpose and role of Wikidata and how we might view it as opposed to more formal things like library authority files? This is a big question, isn't it? <laughs> Um, I'm reluctant to declare anything as taking it as, you know, gospel or the, you know, the authority. Um, and also keep in mind that you often don't even see the whole item. Like we talk about like labels and descriptions, you're only seeing maybe in one language out of the 300 that it's capable of entering in Wikidata. And so you don't know, and a lot of those languages are not filled out or there's no descriptions. So, you know, you're, what you're seeing and thinking of as the central node or the authority is going to be a very different experience from someone who's viewing it in another language, so. Yeah, I think what Rob said is true. I and mean, we're, we're still trying to figure it out in many ways. You know, we had our first Wiki Sites conference this past year and a lot of big questions with very smart people in the room with no clear answers. Uh, but I think, we're, I think it's fair to say we're doing it probably better than most any entity has done so far in trying to unify multiple languages, multiple disciplines, all under one roof, but there's still a lot to go. Like we're talking Berber and all kinds of questions about how to model things that are very, very similar, but probably should be different or, or, yeah, or vice versa. There needs to be um, more librarians in these conversations because we've been mm -hmm. dealing with these issues about how to organize things for hundreds of years. And so someone like me or Marilee will show up one of these things and we have to explain what Berber is to everyone. Um, <laughs> and so that's kind of a fun, I guess. Um, but uh, yeah, so we have a lot to contribute to this conversation and we would like all of you to participate as well. Right, and uh, Mark asked a great question about uh, what's the best place to find out about the social convention and customs. I know Wikipedia can be contentious. The great, I think, overarching theme is Wikidata feels kind of like Wikipedia in 2002, 2003, much more friendly won't bite your head off immediately like you might see in Wikipedia. <laughs> there is a project chat page. So if you go to wikidata.org, on the left-hand column, there's a project chat, and that's the main hangout place for anyone. You can ask very simple questions if you want, even just about, like, I'm not sure what's an instance in a subclass when I'm dealing with X. That's something you see all the time. So it's a very friendly place. People are very much open to inquiry. Um, and I think that is the main place where you're going to find the conversation happening. And also, I would suggest Facebook is a good place. It's a low commitment That's way true. to get involved in these. Like, for example, this is one of a number of groups. I've just put a link to in chat of the Wikidata community. And a lot of us hang out there and are willing to field questions. 
Yeah, there, I will, I'll also put in a pitch for the Wikidata list. I know that librarians love their listservs, um, and there is a listserv <laughs> for, uh, for, for Wikidata as well. So we'll fold those pointers to those different things um, into the resources. This has been a really rich conversation. I think that this is just the beginning of a conversation. We just wanted to give people kind of an orientation, introduce some, um, some uh, local U.S. Uh, uh, experts who are interested in connecting libraries to Wikidata, and hopefully we'll have a couple more webinars that will um, continue to uh, evolve this conversation and allow some more space for, um, for, for more questions and more inquiries. We're also launching a group within the OCLC Research Library Partnership to be able to um, <clears throat> talk to one another about how we're using Wikipedia and Wikidata, so hope to continue the conversation with some of you there. Uh, upcoming at ALA, uh, there's a couple of sessions I want to draw your attention to. There's an ALA conversation starter, uh, which is about leveraging Wikipedia, Wikipedia but really it's also Wikidata um, to help enrich and improve library practices. I hope that some of you will be able to um, come to that session. And then uh, at the OCLC research update on um, Monday, We'll be highlighting the OCLC Link Data Wikibase prototype project, um, which utilizes Wikibase, which is the uh, underlying um, uh, software underneath Wiki, Wikidata, and also um, leverages Wikidata in some interesting ways. So, um, so look out for those two conversations. I know we're over time, but I just want to give another shout out to the OCLC Research Library Partnership. Thanks to all of you um, for being part of that. Uh, this webinar has been recorded. We'll be sending out a lot of links right away, and then also a link to the recording uh, when that's available. So thanks to all of you for asking such great questions, for being so engaged, um, and for tuning in, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, everybody, for uh, tuning in, and this concludes today's webinar. And thank you for showing up to thanks. listen to this talk about our favorite geeky things. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Bye, everyone.